Right, hi everyone, my name is Edward Hutchinson and this is the Edward Hutchinson Podcast. I actually named it after myself, Jesse, which I think is probably... I don't Great know name. I, do you think? Very smart. I'm not sure. Anyway guys, welcome to the podcast. We are joined today by Jesse Harrison, who is the principal, you've just told me? A principal. A principal. Mm -hmm. Oh, a principal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a principal of Harrison Design. Yes. Which is a pretty awesome company based in LA, New York... Atlanta, Atlanta, DC. Okay, I mean, I'm just getting lost now. There's just so many places. But anyway, is uh, in the kind of uh, architectural side, the construction side, interior design side. Mm -hmm. I was actually looking at your company this morning online yes. and trying to work out which niche that you're in, which it kind of just seems everything. Might be easier just to tell you what we don't do. Okay, yeah, I love that. Uh, but anyway, guys, I want you all to welcome Jesse Harrison. It's been actually a real pleasure because actually we connected on Instagram, went for a lunch, which actually I kind of thought, oh, we'll have a 40 minute lunch. And it just went on for like hour, hour, yeah. hour, which was just awesome. Yeah. Um, but we are really, really happy to have him here today. And so I want to welcome Jesse. Um, and Jesse, do you want to give our kind of listeners a bit of background about who you are yeah. and just kind of what you do and then kind of we'll jump into some questions and hopefully give those listeners out there as much value as you possibly can. Sure. So we are, my firm's an architecture and design firm. So okay. primarily we do high-end residential architecture. So high-end homes, obviously, um, and interior design and landscape architecture. Wow. So we really, we design, we don't build. Yes. Um, and the firm's about 30 years old, started in Atlanta okay. originally, and it slowly grew as our clients migrated throughout the country and had second homes and third homes. So that's how you grew? That's how we grew. That's like the definition of organic, literally. Totally organic. That is awesome. And uh, and so we found our way to California about 15, 18 years ago. Yeah. And we now have an office in Santa Barbara and an office in Los Angeles. I moved to LA about 10 years ago okay. to head up this office. And uh, we've been just incredibly fortunate. We have really amazing clients and uh, we've sort of immersed ourselves into the real estate community here and the design community. And, um, you know, we've got just some incredible projects we've been a part of here. And we also do uh, boutique commercial projects. So I don't know if you heard about, for instance, uh, we did the Saban Theater renovation on Wilshire. We did. And we did uh, a big remodel of one of the public's, big public spaces at Sierra Towers in West Hollywood. And is it, uh, what is the public spaces in that? Because I've been to the units and obviously there's one on the top floor right now, which I think is incredibly highly priced. Very, very pricey. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, but it has got amazing views. Yeah. But so what it, is there kind of communal spaces within there? Like so on the sixth floor, so they've got the lobby on the street level. OK. And then on the sixth floor, they have a swimming pool. A uh, spa, a gym. Oh, that's where that is. Uh, they used to have what was called a manager's apartment. They have uh, a, a private event space for their residents. Yeah. And so uh, four or five years ago, we did a big remodel with the, the board there and did uh, all those spaces over and rearranged everything. Uh, so that's the kind of boutique commercial work we do from time to time, and yeah. we're slowly getting more of it. And then we're also... Uh, the executive architect for, I don't know if you've heard about the, the proposed hotel in Benedict Canyon. Yes. Uh, so we're the executive architect on that. Um, we have an amazing client who uh, is working on that. We're working right now to uh, get the city on board. and, and it's I suppose with that, it's so unknown, the time frames at this stage. Super unknown, yeah. and it's, it's, uh, it's just a slow... It's a slow burn. Okay. We have to, you know, but people in the community have really come around, and um, we've had a couple of events, and people are uh, really on board with it and supportive. So, so those are the kind of projects we we do a little bit of everything, and our different offices do other kinds of, you know, aging in place, and we're doing a, a country club yeah. renovation in outside Santa Barbara. So we do a little bit of everything. How do you manage to like spread yourself time wise then? Because I presume it's at the start, it's kind of like everything's in one place. You've got yeah. all your employees; they're there kind of, you can visit the sites, but when yeah. they're spread, even from Santa Barbara to here, that must be difficult for you, you must have people you trust within the company to be able to Oh, do we things. have just an incredible group of people, and so um, we have project managers and architects, and um, and I have my counterparts, um, the other principals here, and so, you know, you just, you know, in LA, you just, or in Southern California, you have to be really thoughtful about yeah. how you manage your time and your geography, so... We all just divide and conquer, you know, we all just, uh, I stay 99% in LA. Okay. And and in LA, 99% on the west side. Really? You know? okay. Yeah, so our primary focus residential, in our residential projects is 
Beverly Hills, Bel Air, um, Brentwood Palisades, Malibu. Um, Where are all the, the high rise properties? Yeah, we just uh, got a nice project in Hancock Park. Amazing. You know, Sunset Plaza. So we kind of stay in a limited geographical area. Yeah. And so for the listeners out there, obviously, yeah. I think they a lot of people aren't in L.A. and they're from across the world and they're thinking, well, you know, L.A. is full of famous people and that's yeah. kind of what happens. For us, I think it becomes a little bit more normal because actually totally. here, Hollywood is the main industry or has been over the last kind of 30, 40 years. Yeah. So it becomes a kind of situation where that person, yes, they are famous and everyone knows who they are, but they're just a successful person in their kind of own right. Totally. How is that dealing with those kinds of people? Because I know, and obviously we, we don't want to name drop here, and I don't want this to become a place where we're trying to get attention for that purpose. Sure. But you must kind of have, there's other steps that you need to take when you're dealing with people at that level, I presume. Yeah, and it's really not. Everybody thinks all your big clients are celebrities and producers. And, yeah. And a real estate agent years ago told me, listen, most celebrities don't really have that kind of money. Yeah. They don't really have that much money because they don't, in the old days, the Tom Cruises of the world, you know, the big celebrities, um, they 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 get made immense amounts of money because they were producing their movies and they had residuals. On the younger Hollywood now and, and the, all the, the A-list celebrities now, maybe under 40, yeah. they don't make that kind of money. And the real estate, as you see, is crazy expensive. So we have a few Hollywood clients, and yeah. but they're way up the food chain because they're the only kind of clients who can afford to build multi-million dollar houses, you know, people who are way up, way up in the stratosphere. So it's really mostly just normal, whatever normal means in LA, yeah. but it's normal people. It's people who come from a significant family wealth, people who come from some kind of tech industry. Old money, new money. Old money, new money, people who've inherited a lot of money, yeah. um, people who are servicing the entertainment business, you know, someone who might be a big shot agent or somebody in a law firm. It's not really, I don't know if you found that, but Hollywood I, is in our backyard, but we don't deal with Hollywood, the Hollywood much. crowd that much. Yeah, and that's weird because actually, I mean, I think we do see the headline ones of like, oh, Jennifer Aniston sells her house sure. for this. Or, or Beyonce pays yeah, $90 million for her house. For her house. But then actually you're 100% right because 90% of when you see something go, yeah. my head does not go, oh, which celebrity bought that? Totally. It's more... Okay, well, that's someone. And actually, what I've realized, the more that kind of we spend time in Reneo Drive and Beverly Hills, and for the people that really do have money, yeah. privacy is the most important kind of thing oh, for them. hundred percent. And it's and it's a lot of international people, too. Yeah. And they don't really... Some people want to be famous. Some people want a, a notoriety. Some people say, tell people you're doing my house. You can yeah. talk about it. But most people don't want to talk about it. You know, you talk about showing their house to other people or talking about their house or publishing their house. I'd say 80% of our clients are not interested not in interested that. Not interested in that, yeah. No. And that's what I've kind of found is it, it kind of, when I'm kind of moving in those circles and interacting with people who are, you know, billionaires or they're kind of close to that level, yeah. it, they've kind of got bored of money almost in a way where it's not about showing Sick off. Of yeah, it, you know what I mean? It's yeah. not like, oh, look at my new Lamborghini or my Ferrari. And the more yeah. that I see people do that, the more now my head goes, oh, hold on a second do you actually have money or is this all of your money you've just put into this car to try and play the role of? Because there's a huge amount of like, I think from my wife's family in Chicago actually where you spend a lot of time I think sure. as well. Yeah. Um, that's that very much old money vibe. Totally. And so I think LA definitely plays to the new money where we walk down Rodeo Drive and I'm sure you see it all the time. It's just, oh, gold plated Ferrari or, or like... the yellow Lamborghini in front of Bijan or whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. the Rolls Royce. The Rolls yeah. Royce, yeah. 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 But that's really the minority. You it know, is, it's yeah. funny, you see all these crazy big houses, these big spec houses yeah. that are now the top sort of, that's the headline in real estate here right now, wouldn't you agree? Is yeah. Everyone's just sort of scratching their heads saying, who's going to buy them? Who are we? Yeah. And who's buying these? And, and I think a group of developers tried to reshape the market here and try, there was a big race to build the biggest, most expensive, most elaborate house. Yeah. But the problem that I see is they didn't really understand who the buyers were for those houses. And so a lot of these houses they designed were super flashy and gimmicky and they don't really work yeah. for billionaires or royals. And so these houses now, some of them are just sitting around collecting dust, taking huge price reductions and everyone's sort of saying, well, now what? Like, yeah. what do you do with these things? No, absolutely. And so it's weird. You're right. Like a, a part of it is the new money thing. Yeah. But part of it is... 
no matter how much money you have, new money or old money, these people are sophisticated. They have people around them advising them. They've traveled all over the world and they're not stupid. And, and I feel like if, if they're in that position where they're going to spend that volume of money, they are not going to buy what someone else's dream was. They're going to create what they want to totally. the T. But they're also not going to buy, I don't mean to sound like this, but they're not going to buy sloppy seconds yeah. in the sense that something that's been sitting around for two or three years and nobody else wanted to buy, nobody wants to be perceived to be the dummy yeah, who, built who, it who overpaid for it. Yeah. And so it's it's really interesting and it's kind of, I feel really badly for some of the developers who put their neck out there yeah. and built some of these crazy houses because every I heard it over and over again. LA is underpriced. You know, compared to New York and and London oh, and yeah, Hong Kong, for, oh my yeah. gosh, we're so undervalued. And and I think they just thought if you build it, they'll come. They yeah. thought that all these mega wealthy people were just going to flock to L.A. Yeah. and drop one hundred and fifty million dollars on a house. Yeah. And I think all of my really wealthy clients know they don't need to spend one hundred and fifty million dollars in L.A. to get it trophy property plus i think it's also not a good investment especially from a california standpoint mm -hmm. i.e you're paying on the purchase price right so instead of buying a lot of land spending a year two years well probably a lot longer than that four years building out something that you really love and want and obviously it's going to be reassessed yeah but you're not going to be paying the 150 mil yeah that's this kind of insane kind of price that someone's put out there because you're paying like one over one percent a year i think it's one and a quarter one and a yeah. quarter so yeah. it becomes kind of like wow the guy that has built that wealth and that much money yeah is not going to turn around and throw 15 million down every year just to have the house you, know? you actually raised one of the best points which fascinated me is people think that very wealthy people yeah don't care about money or that they don't understand or that they're not going to be upset about little chunks of money yeah. and it's actually the opposite you're yeah, right i'll never forget we did a huge house here one of the biggest projects we did for a, a middle eastern royal yeah with lots and lots and lots of money right i mean i saw them spend money in ways i've never even seen people spend money before really? right just six seven eight nine i mean you name it brings 25 people around with them into oh, i mean just you know it's just dropping crazy money on yeah. things right <laughs> But they built this home in Beverly Hills, yeah. 65,000 square feet or so. What? It's a vacation home, right? And after the fact, and this is just a house that, that this client uses once in a while, right? After the fact, three, four months later, I kept saying, you know, this is going to be really expensive to run this house. But expensive for me and expensive for somebody like that is different two style. different planets, yeah. right? Yeah. And I remember we got a call about four or five months into living in the house and it wasn't that they couldn't afford it. It was just, oh my God. Like between the property sense. taxes and the amount of staff you have to have and, and a house manager. You know, a good house manager for that kind of property is a hundred, hundred and twenty five thousand a year to have someone sit there. And and on top of that, crazy things. Like they had I don't know how many TVs in the house and they yeah. wanted they wanted cable and they wanted Sky News and all this. Well, just their cable and phone and internet bill for the house was like Twenty or thirty thousand a month. Are you joking me? And so, and then you think, oh, AC. How many zones have you? Oh got? my god! AC I mean, yeah, and, and and the kind of gardener you have to have to maintain that kind of property, Jesus. and the kind of you know a hydrologist to maintain your fountains, and and so it just went on and on and on. And so it's interesting you say that because the wealthier somebody is, yeah. the more finicky they are about not wanting to get ripped off. And it's those little, one of my clients has an expression, death by a thousand paper cuts. Yeah. And that's what it is. And there's nothing more annoying to a person of wealth than to feel like they're being held hostage yeah. with their money. And I feel like actually the ones that I know of that kind of net wealth, like, and I have a relationship with, they almost go through this cycle of, okay, give, give, give to my parents, my family, whoever like I'm around. And then they get to that moment of like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> That's and they, it. Yeah, and they clear it out. Yeah. And then they go back to doing that a little bit, you know, six months, a year later, and they try and stop themselves. But yeah, it definitely is that stress. Of, it's not, oh, I need to lay down this massive check. It's, I'm laying down 5,000 checks yeah. in a two-week period, and this is just constant now. And where is all the money that I'm, like, making going? Well, and, and so it's funny, going back to, the you know, these, these big crazy houses and what's yeah. happening in the market here. The other thing is... They're kind of gimmicky, some of them, Definitely. right? They all kind of look the same to some degree. Yeah. Um, they're beautiful, but none of them is particularly distinctive to me when I look at it. Of course, yeah. I'm probably a little jaded. But the other thing is, I think 
the new up and coming wealthy, right? Yeah. The new, and when I say new, I mean millennial generation, millennial, and 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 anybody even under fifty, let's say, yeah. right? Whether they've inherited their money or they're a tech, you know, phenom who made you know billions of dollars. There's such a paradigm shift happening in how the mega wealthy display their wealth yeah. or don't display their wealth. So true. And I'm not so sure that most of these people, they want beautiful houses, they want an impressive house, but they also, like, look at Mark Zuckerberg. He lives in what, like a three or five million dollar house? Yeah. I think you're going to see coming up, I have clients who could afford ten times more house than they have. Yeah. But they realize at some point there's a diminishing return. Why would I don't it? need a house this big. I don't want to be a slave to my house. Yeah. I don't want to live with people in my house all day. And I have to live in it. I'm a human being. Yeah. You know, my spouse and I or my kids, do I want to sit in a house that feels like a museum or a hotel? I think you're 100% right. And weirdly, like, I, I tie it back to some trends that we're definitely seeing, i.e. like the WeWork situation. Totally. Whereas before it was like, oh, well, I want my own office. I'm not going to go and like now it's like, OK, I just want the location. I want, you know, the ability to do what I want to do, but I don't need all this, like, you know, rigmarole of a lobby and anything like that. If I'm going to have an office, I can just put myself there. Our biggest client right now who is doing developments in L.A., yeah. they are targeting the young professional who basically is doing a we work but for living. And so, therefore, you get your own bedroom with an ensuite bathroom. For living. Yeah, and you're yeah. paying $1,600 for a one-bedroom, amazing bedroom and bathroom, yeah. and you're sharing the living kind of area I have a client rooms. friend and he's investing big time in the co-living yeah. I think it's you know what the buzzword I think will be is just flexibility 100% and in the houses too yeah. people used to have the formal dining room and the formal living room and now you're seeing open plan well like the great room these sort of undefined totally flexible spaces yeah. some people aren't even doing formal dining rooms anymore some Definitely. people a lot of these younger people with, with, with money yeah. are doing a 180 from what their parents and grandparents did and they don't care and they and they're even in even in the style of house they're doing they're not doing traditional they're not doing modern they're doing this transitional in the middle yeah where it's kind of traditional but kind of modern and so i think you're gonna see i think that that has a lot more age though do you not think kind of you know five years down the line i think that looks a lot better than building the modern of today i think so yeah i think i think la has gotten so carried away with the, the you know there, there was well there was the white box thing which kind of started dying about five to eight years ago yeah, and now we're seeing some of those on the market and they're not doing that well no and and I mean you're right it's kind of you can almost date every house in LA yeah. by style yeah and and the transitional thing now we're seeing a big uptick all of a sudden at the high end in this Napa Valley sort of transitional right wood siding steel windows yeah. metal roof character. Like yeah, but like, it's funny. I was with a really uh, very prestigious designer yesterday who said, yeah, I like it, but in five years, is that going to be done? And now you've paid 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars to build a house. Yeah. By the time you're in it for two years, it's kind of out of fashion. fashion. So, which is true, and then it like because that's where my mind goes back to when I first started in real estate. Yeah. Like, 20, end of 2011, I'm in London. Kind of you know i'm out of college I'm, I'm starting real estate and i was kind of learning it and it was very weird because london is so it's almost the opposite of la hmm. it's very small and compact right and so it's become this situation where it's surrounded by a green belt so the prices are kind of held there you cannot knock things down and kind yeah. of rebuild but then when i was going through it it was like london had been bombed and so therefore in the 50s 60s 70s 80s there were these holes on streets where the country didn't have a huge amount of money. Mm. And so they built very cheaply with concrete. Mm. And so at the time when I was selling in 2011, it was like, oh my God, that is at the bottom rung. You know what I mean? It's almost like that's 20 years old now from the 80s, 30 years old. So therefore, that's not cool. If you're going to buy something, the cheapest stuff is that concrete 80s stuff. Mm. Weirdly, over the last like two years now in London, the concrete 80s stuff is now becoming kind of cool. Hmm. Yeah, where it's like, you look at the old Victorian style and you're like, okay, well, that's like, you know, 150 years old. How is that still cool now? I feel like they, these, well, these that's houses... that's a pedigree, maybe. That's it. But yeah. then I also feel like they go through this stage of like 10 years from when they were built, then it becomes out of taste. When it ages to like 40, 50 years, yeah. people are like, ooh, that's like looking back in, in the past and no one builds like that anymore. And it's got that kind of aging character of like, that was a time. 
And so therefore mm. people buy it as like a piece of history almost as opposed to being... Well, also was what what's really appropriate in the setting. I mean, yeah. I still find... So true. When I drive around LA or Beverly Hills and I see certain styles of house, I don't want to be unkind, but <laughs> like I see, you know... Uh, Fleur de Lis is a great example. You yeah. know the Fleur de Lis, the Saperstein estate? Yes. Incredible house. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible property. When you're on the property in, in moments, you feel like you could be anywhere. You could be in Europe. You could be on the yeah. East Coast. You could be anywhere. But then you'll be in this incredibly, beautifully executed formal room with all this heavy ornamentation and heavy fabrics and antiques. And you'll look out the window. And because we're in L.A. and things are so tight, you'll see palm trees and, and you'll see it that you'll uh, see the roof of a modern house yeah. and, and and not specifically about that but i just remember it always strikes me people trying to bring these european kind of estates to la whether yeah. it's a french or an english or italianate or whatever it is certain styles i think work like i think italianate homes and tuscan homes kind of work because the topography and the light and everything in la you can do Cyprus, and you yeah. can... You, and it you, ties in with that Spanish style. It does, and it, well, it ties yeah. in with the landscape, and it feels still appropriate. Yeah. But people doing these uber, uber traditional, you know, there was an event the other night I went to in Beverly Park, and and the, this couple built a, a beautiful um, East Coast sort of colonial home in Beverly Park. And columns and things. No, it was it, a little bit, but uh, it was it's very understated and traditional. But okay. it, it, once you got on the property, you felt like you were in the Hamptons. Yeah, beautiful. And and some of the people there were like, God, I feel like I'm in the Hamptons, or I feel like I'm in Connecticut. It worked there because they're on like four acres, so Same. they completely controlled their surroundings. But you put it in the flats of Beverly Hills, where you can see five neighbors. It's odd to me. Yeah, it's odd to me that. People want to build something here that, to me, seems completely out of place. Yeah, At least in London or in Manhattan or in other cities, pretty much everything you build fits in the context of the block it's on and, yeah. and of the city and of the topography and the weather. But here, people just build anything. Yeah. It feels like in those cities, which do feel a little bit older, even though LA is not a young city, but they, they've evolved over time yeah. in different areas, whereas here it feels like, okay this is an old house. There's no yeah. protecting of that necessarily. It's let's get rid of that and then let's build something. Let's knock it all down and let's just build something else. Well, things are disposable here. That's yeah. what's so crazy. I mean, houses from the 80s are disposable. Yeah. You know, what other city in the world will you buy a house that's 25 or 30 years old and tear it down? Yeah. A nice house. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible to me. Like People walk through them and just bulldoze them. And yeah. it's like... You would never hear of that in, in the rest of the world, in Asia and in Europe. 100%. Houses are gener multi-generational. Yeah. They're built to be there for centuries. Yeah. So it's, it's strange. That is something that always, to me, is an issue. And I don't know if this just... Because I think it is becoming less of an issue for me. But I come from London. And yeah. I grew up around a city where everything's built out of brick. You know yeah. what I mean? It's kind of, this is built to last. Most of the houses have been there over 100 years when you're driving down a street. And so... I was looking at a house and it sells for a million, you know, one and a half million pounds. And you're thinking, okay, that's a lot of money, but, you know, you're buying something that's kind of historic. Here, when I'm seeing, you know, even the like 10 million, 20 million dollar plus mansions going up, yeah. and we see it constantly. It's kind of crazy now when you're driving through the streets of Bel Air, Beverly Hills, in the hills. And it's like every third house seems to be going through some kind of oh, constructional yeah. work. Oh, yeah. But it's wooden frames yeah. and then plyboard. Yeah. And so I'm in my head, I'm like... That's going to be 20 million. And you know when you kind of buy a nice handbag or shoes or whatever it is, the quality of the build yeah. is everything. And totally. I feel like the house that you're going to buy is almost the biggest investment. It's what you should care about the most in terms of the build quality. And it's just, and I suppose here it's, it's earthquakes, isn't it? It's Well, yeah, I mean, that part of it is obviously, well, it's mostly cost, really. I mean, it really is cost driven. I've never, we've never had a client say... I want to build a, a house with wood framing yeah. for any reason other than the fact that they don't want to spend the money to build a house that's completely poured concrete, right? Really? We did a house not that long ago for an international client, and that client insisted on building their entire house out of concrete and metal stud framing. How does that, I suppose because it's one element in an earthquake that actually holds it well? Because I can't imagine it's that flexible concrete. I mean, all the seismic code in, in California is extremely strict. Yeah. Obviously, after, you know, there, there was a big Northridge earthquake. Yeah. And, and so now the, all the codes over the last 20, 25 years since Northridge um, have become extremely strict. And they've 
you know, really tighten the reins on, on building and building yeah. codes and the seismic. And, <clears throat> but really it has, it's nothing to do with the seismic. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a wood framed house is, it, it's still safe. It's not unsafe compared to a concrete house. Yeah. It's really just about, to me, it's really about longevity. It's, you know, when you're building with wood, yeah. wood over time is just going to deteriorate. It's a, it's a living thing. It's yeah, a living, well, yeah. breathing ma- building material, right? And, you know, if you get a leak or you get termites or you have dry rot or whatever you have, wood's just going to deteriorate. When you remodel a house in Beverly Hills that's 30 years old and you open up the walls, mm-hmm. a significant amount of that wood framing has deteriorated for whatever reason. That actually was something I was going to ask you. Yeah. Because I suppose we, I see it driving past, but it's very rare that I'm actually doing the deconstruction of a yeah. house before. So when you're actually taking away the kind of stud walls and all of that, underneath you just... Well, you pull back the drywall or the plaster and there's the there's the framing and the insulation underneath. Yeah. And that framing, you know, after 20 or 30 years, probably wasn't built perfectly to, to begin now. with. Yeah. And... You know, over the years, and so at that point, it's really unfortunate because people open these walls and they think, oh, I'm just going to do a, a remodel. And psychologically, people think it's faster, it's cheaper, yeah. it's actually usually more expensive and it takes longer. Yeah. Because you're now surgically trying to save. Fix things. And, yeah. It's like trying to, you know, reassemble your heart one valve at a time versus a transplant. You know, it's, it just doesn't know. work. But, but you know, a lot of international people don't look at a house as it's for me and my family and then once I die or sell it, bulldoze it what do i care you know we had this one client who insisted and his that their entire house is concrete metal and limestone and with with bronze doors and windows i mean that house will probably outlast your grandchildren and their children but it's it's extremely expensive what are we looking at cost wise in terms of uh you know direct comparable if you're building something six thousand square feet in wood as opposed to that in, is there a, you know, it's double uh, the cost? Of course you ask me that. Sorry. Uh, I mean. mean, well, it depends. It depends on also what you're putting on the outside of the house. You know, yeah. in this particular okay. case, they built a stone house, so they put limestone. The big thing in L.A. is people want a house that looks like limestone, but they don't want to pay for real limestone. So they make what's called precast. It's it's a it's a man-made product made from, from stone yeah. and molded to look like real stone. And if you half the houses you drive by today in Beverly Hills are with stone on them are probably precast. Really? And it looks like stone. It doesn't last as long as limestone. It doesn't age the same, but it's significantly less expensive. Off the top of my head, I would say it's 30 to 50% less expensive. And I suppose when you're building a house of that scale, which you yeah. are in those locations, then that adds up to quite a lot of money. Totally. And and But then building the house out of concrete, it's the cost. You yeah. know, I'd say it's... Gosh, it, it's got to be double the cost for yeah. the structure of the house, but it also takes a lot longer to do. Really? Okay. Of course, I mean you've got to, and on top of it, everything has to be perfect the first time. Yeah, you can't. You know, when when you frame something, and if you let's say you and your wife were building a house, mm-hmm. you pour the entire foundation, and then you went vertical, and you and you poured all these walls in concrete. Yeah, and if your wife walks in and goes, "Gosh, I'd really love a window there." Like, you're talking big money and a yeah. lot of time. If it's wood framing, you just cut the framing out and reframe it, and it's it's flexible. If you want to remodel later, you can't punch through a, a concrete wall. You can, but it's extremely it's expensive, expensive and it compromises the structure. So there's a lot of reasons why people do it. So that takes me on to this thing, Jesse, that I've been having dreams about. When are we, you and I, going to develop a material yeah. that is like the wood? Or does this exist? Because I feel like if someone could do like some kind of resin material that had the flexibility of wood, but a lot more sturdy, yeah. But so you could build the house and have the flexibility, yeah. but it also is going to last. There are new... Um, so it's interesting. Our, our One of my clients is building right now, and he has been researching and, and has actually traveled to Europe to look at some of these new lightweight building materials. Really? Um, I don't know if they're rated yet for residential use. I think they're primarily being used for commercial okay. applications. And the cost is high. rises and hospitality, sort of you know, building hotels and restaurants and, and um, smaller commercial. Yeah. But I, 100%, I think you're going to see the next big movement in building is going to be alternative building materials building okay. materials that are sustainable that that are um, green that have more longevity yeah, that are lighter weight yeah, for sure. um, that take less time to uh, assemble mm-hmm. and, and to build these projects and also that that 
um, are more green in the sense that, you know, freighting all of these products around the globe, I mean, you're freighting timber, you're freighting, you know, all the materials for roofs and, and all the materials to, to put stone on the yeah. sides of houses or wood siding or stuff, whatever it is, um, there's, a, there's an impact on the environment in just transporting all these materials. So you have lighter weight materials that are easier to, and faster to transport, Definitely. less of a lead time, less of an impact on the environment, less costly. Um, yeah, I th and I think they're going to come out of, uh, probably out of Europe. I mean, it's yeah. in my opinion, it seems like all the cutting edge... No Asia and that kind of could Chinese. be. Well, yeah. I think all the innovation will probably come out of Europe. You and know, copied. They're, they're, at least what I've heard and what this client has told me is, um, I think this is an Italian company, company, and, yeah. and you know the in, in the, the the Danish and the Dutch and the Norwegians are very cutting edge when it comes to design and construction and yeah, they are, um, for and sure. materials. I think you'll see some innovation come out of Europe, in my opinion, and then you'll see the Asians streamline how to manufacture it copy and do it cheaper and actually yeah, totally and how to and do it scale and how to scale it yeah but you're right I, and like so i'm literally getting really deep into conversation sorry guys if this is just like <laughs> I, I literally said to jesse before we started this we're gonna get off on some tangent and i've literally got i think 15 questions to ask him here I let's go one move on yeah something else um there was actually one more thing i wanted to ask you before yeah. we go and actually because i just want to ask you a question about you because yeah. i think there's a whole element of that as well as just your knowledge on real estate that, that a lot of the listeners would find really interesting and engaging yeah do you think what do you think of this because when you were just saying that in terms of the transportation all of that kind of side of new building materials i I've seen some videos online of the 3D printing. Yeah. You know, and obviously at the moment, I think it's very testing. They're doing like little models and they're doing, I saw actually one, I think, where they were building houses in Africa. Yeah. But they're literally dripping Crazy. whatever it was and going around. Do you think that could, that is going to eventually go into the luxury market and that kind of side or? I mean, I don't want this to, I, I, Oh yeah, this is gonna be like ten years in the yeah. Uh, someone will say, test. "What a dummy!" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Got like wow, how zero, zero foresight there. Yeah, uh, you can't predict the future. Let's just put that out there, guys. So I'll say this: I'll give you, a, I'll give you a political, a politician's kind of answer. I like that. Uh, my feeling is that at the at the very top, right, the point oh one percent of yeah. people, because that's where we live. We live in the point oh. We don't live in the one percent. We live in the absolute top of the stratosphere, yeah. within ten miles of, of where we're sitting. Um, I don't know that there'll ever be any kind of mass production appeal to people at the very high end. Okay. I think when you're talking about building houses in Africa or building sustainable housing um, for maybe um, sustainable and affordable housing or building housing for the masses or temporary, or temporary yeah. housing or building housing in third world countries or um, things like that, I could see an application for it. Okay. I'm not sure that kind of technology will be that useful to people at the high end yeah. it might it might streamline certain parts of it yeah but i just don't see someone who's wealthy and opinionated yeah. and has choices going for something like that yeah. i don't i don't think we're 10 20 years out from yeah. something like that personally it's kind of like self-driving cars yeah people it's always like talk true. about i've had people say to me do i even need a garage because in 10 years no one's going to be driving and i said well the masses may not be driving but somebody worth billions of dollars like is still going to have their own car. Yep. And, and even if they are in a self-driving car, they're going to have their own fleet of self-driving cars. They're not going to get in somebody else's. So I don't know. At the high end, I think the rules are kind of out the window. I think you're 100% right. I think maybe you fast forward like 200 years. Maybe, yeah. yeah and absolutely. you have some helicopter that comes in and basically just lays stuff out. Then it becomes like a pretty crazy, you know, that's the new way to build stuff. Yeah, I was doing podcasts. Um, so that is going to be really interesting. But anyway, I think let's like definitely tune in on that because I think yeah. in 10 years, imagine if that's starting to become the new thing. In 100 years, back. find me and yeah. let's see if we were right or wrong. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. we're still alone in 100 yeah. years. Um, okay, so Jesse, I just want to get some more personal stuff about you and yeah. how you actually find yourself now in the position that you are. Yeah. So where originally you from, born and raised uh, in the US, of yeah. course, I'm presuming? From Atlanta. From yeah. Atlanta. From the South. And you travel back there quite regularly? Not so much anymore. My family's all on the West Coast now, so okay. um, our biggest office is still in Atlanta, and it's kind of where our home base is for you know a lot of our back of the house stuff, okay. like accounting and HR and stuff like that. Is that generally because actually the you know you, you actually have employees that you've had there for a long time, but I presume you don't yeah. have to pay someone the same 
to do the back end administrative uh, stuff that you do in LA? Or? It's maybe a little less expensive, but that's not really thing. the reason. It's okay. just that was the original office. That's the biggest office. Our founding principal still is based in Atlanta, and that's where his office I is, see. even though he travels all over to all the offices regularly. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of where we started, and um, it's just we've had we have a team there. You know, some of our folks have been with the company for two decades or more. Wow. So, um, you know, it's just, it's easy. It works really well for us, and that way we don't have to have all these people in each office individually, so it works. But, yeah, I grew up in Atlanta, and uh, was not for me. No? No. Um, it's a beautiful city. It's an incredible place. But for me, I just, California was always where I wanted to be. And when was that? Did you, was that from watching TV, or you came out to California? TV as TV? a kid, yeah. you know, yeah. I always kind of was fascinated by L.A. and Beverly Hills and just the whole California everything the aesthetic and the lifestyle and the weather and yeah, yeah. and then as i came here more as as a kid and as a as an adult i realized wow people can really live like that you know and people can go surfing and then go skiing and go to the desert and yeah. wear shorts and in january and um and you know have the hollywood experience in your backyard and you know so just it's just boxes. yeah i mean it's just it's i mean you're newer I, here but it's just yeah it's, I've been here 10 years and there are times when, you know, flying home from a trip, it's like, wow, I'll fly over the city and go, wow, I live here. Like, yeah. it's amazing. You know, to me, it's the same because actually, like, I was born and raised in London, which is an incredible city. Sure. I mean, like, there are certain elements of London that I would love to be here. Sure. I think that kind of 24 hour vibe yeah. that London sometimes has, New York similarly. But it is crazy because I always thought I was born and raised in the city. I'm a city guy. I'm never going to be that person that kind of, you know, I'll do the trips to the beach and I'll do the trips to the mountains and whatever. But when I first, my wife, at the time she was my girlfriend, moved here. Actually, my first impression was moving down to downtown LA hmm. in 2009. Interesting. And I was like, this is not <laughs> what the TV has told me LA is. Yeah, no. Yeah, went to Venice, fell in love with Venice because yeah. I was like, I live in a city. And then I also have the ability to basically surf every day be in the sun, go travel up the coast to Malibu and be on the beaches and do whatever. Like, it was kind of like I can have my cake and eat it. Sure. So it was kind of a similar vibe for you. Yeah. And it's, look, Atlanta's a, you know, and I, I've spent time in Chicago and New York and, and Atlanta and Chicago and New York, those are all amazing cities. Yeah. But I think organically you just click with a city or you don't, yeah. right? And Atlanta is a wonderful city and there's so much innovation and huge companies there. Yeah. But it just wasn't right for me. And so LA just, I just, I don't know if you just know it, but I knew it. And then yeah. the second I got off the plane here... I've always felt at home here. And, and you I've, look forward to going home when you're on a trip. Back. I do, yeah. and I've never found it difficult here to meet people or make friends or colleagues. Or L.A. just has such an open, yeah, an openness to it. You know, people are open to... I'm positive. Very positive, and people are open to, to collaborating and meeting and yeah. taking a meeting, and, and people are just receptive here. And, and so even though we kind of rag on the city a little bit mm -hmm. on the architecture real estate side where everything is sort of disposable and new and yeah. on the other hand LA is so open to new ideas and um, doing things differently and giving somebody a shot and so there's something there's like an electricity here yeah no, definitely because this whole city was kind of built on innovation and doing things in, in a different way and yeah and creating things so that's what i always find amazing is you know when i walk into a lot of cities it's kind of like if you're an older person yeah it's almost you're looking down on the younger people like oh you don't know what i've seen da, 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 da. Yeah. in la there isn't that vibe not at I all find. yeah it's no. kind of like oh you're young oh you come from that place and i think that maybe is because everyone's moved to la as well totally so it becomes like a kind of oh well you've got a different experience than i do and it's not like some of the families that like i still am very close with in london I literally see the, the son at my age and they just have become the father. Yeah. Like completely like wearing the same clothes that they did when we were little kids, you know, like the chinos Fun. or whatever. And I'm like, sounds great. God, thank God. I've kind of like moved away from that. Well, people here aren't thing. snobby. I, yeah, I find people here so are true. super inclusive. Yeah. You know, I'd say like Bel Air is probably the closest thing yeah. in, in, in the wealthy part of LA to like the Upper East Side of New York or whatever the most elite part of London or Paris or whatever would be. And, you know, I find our clients, the people we do business with, no matter how much money they have or how prominent they are, yeah. they're incredibly inclusive and open-minded and um, 
just really approachable and easy to get along with. So no, that's what I like about LA. I think it's just an amazing city. Yeah. And, and it's gone through such a renaissance in the last decade. I mean, I moved here at like the perfect time because to me, people in other major cities sort of looked down on LA for a long time. It was just sort of like, it was Hollywood plus Beverly Hills plus a beach, yeah. right? There was nothing here. There was no depth. But in the last decade, it's incredible. I mean, you see just what's happened here with the museums and with the performing arts yeah. and the restaurant scene and even the shopping and all the cultural things in this city. It's incredible. I mean, And you know what, weirdly, I think the internet plays incredibly well into yeah. LA's court. Totally. Because it became like a thing before. It was like, oh, you need to be on Wall Street. Because if you were to yeah. trade, you needed to walk down the street or send a courier to do whatever. Yeah. Now a person can run an investment firm in New York yeah. while living in LA. Yeah. Which is kind of now it becomes more you're choosing the environment for like enjoying it as opposed totally. to I just need to be here for my work or whatever it is. Well, I was in New York last week and yeah. the New York LA connection is almost a little unnerving. Yeah. How tightly connected they are. I mean, it's 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 incredible. It's like you're right. Across the, the it really is. I mean, it's almost sort of like they might as well just have a shuttle that runs between New York and LA. I'll be in New York and run into LA people and all the New York people are in LA. And yeah. it's just, it's so intrinsically connected now and you're right in every way people in finance people in the design world the arts all of it so yeah. it and london a lot of brits here as you Definitely. know so la has become this sort of global hub in every industry so i think yeah seeing the emergence of silicon beach now totally yeah. Yeah. silicon beach and all the tech companies you know the olympics are coming again to los angeles yeah. we now have all these major sports teams so really it's pretty much on an equal playing field no pun intended of any other city in the in the world yeah. but that's what's so interesting back to the real estate is it's just not there no, in that sense so true. and so because i think it is just so spread out that you don't have the same don't you don't know. have to like true. people don't want to pay for something they don't have to pay for yeah. and i don't think rich people okay. are interested in paying more just for the bragging rights of paying more yeah, and definitely. so i think we're going to see a real interesting correction sure. Not even a correction. We're going to see an interesting um, settling of the dust yeah. no, in the I next right. five years. Did you see actually one of the ones, so it's actually next to what, the one on Bel Air Road that yeah. we discussed in the past. Yeah. Actually, if you guys out there, you've seen a helicopter on it. There was a surgeon, I think, who built a property next door. Uh, Dr. Canodian. Dr. Canodian. Yeah. Apparently it hit the market yesterday, and it was quite funny because I was re watching... Re-hit the market? So it hit the market, but for <laughs> leasing. A million and a half a month. A million and a half a month. Yeah. But what the hilarious thing was is that I saw it on a Instagram story from one of our colleagues in the office because he yeah. just took a screenshot of yeah. the string. And I literally, for like five minutes, because I didn't have the audio, I was thinking, how stupid are these people? They've missed a zero off the end of the listing price for sale. That's what I thought at first, too. Really? I thought, wait, what's happening here? And then I saw the for lease and I thought, <laughs> okay, I mean, look, and I have nothing but respect and a little bit of empathy for the agents marketing this yeah. property because everybody for a while was just kind of struggling to price these things and kind of making it up as they went along right with clients who thought they knew yeah right and so now you've got a property that's beautiful mm -hmm. but everybody's stuck with it now so because that's where my head went yesterday is i just literally jumped into hold on a second if these high-end properties are not going to sell Obviously, the owners are then going to lease them out, but does it become almost your luxury Airbnb kind of situation where people are renting them for three days because it's 10 bedrooms? Instead of spending five grand a night to be at the luxury five star hotel, you're basically doing your 10 mates or whatever it is, or 20 people all putting five grand a night down? Not a lot of strategy there yeah, long term. I mean, and yeah. I think, well, the problem you've got, so the one next door, the one we talked about. Yeah. That was built by a, you know, a well-known LA guy. Oh, no, he's not. No, LA, he's not, no, he's LA, LA guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at least from what I understand, he, he had the money to do it, right, comfortably. Yeah. He built it. I think he enjoys the process. He built it because he wanted to, yeah. right? And I don't, my suspicion is if his doesn't sell, I don't think it's going to be the end of him financially. No. Most of these other people, they have investors or they have leverage somehow to build these houses. They can't just sit on them forever. So... What do they do? Declare bankruptcy or... Uh... It may not be that extreme, but like, what do they do? Then they come out with these crazy prices and after a year, now the price is slashed again. So nobody really knows what it's What's really worth. That, yeah. Nobody wants to buy... As you know, in real estate, the worst thing you can hear is stale. Yeah. Something's been on there for yeah. a while. Nobody... Then it's toxic. It's radioactive. Exactly. And so that to me just reeked of, oh my God, they just... 
They just need money coming in the door, right? Which I could totally understand. And they have no idea what to do with these. And this is just one of what? A dozen or yeah. more on the market now that are that's north crazy. of a hundred million, and there's more coming. And then there's one coming at five hundred, and so that's where I'm a bit like, okay, well, when you, something you know was originally two fifty is now listed at one fifty and hasn't sold, the guy that's building a five hundred must be looking around thinking, oh my word, <laughs> I'd love to be a fly on the wall in yeah, those, in those meetings. But it's interesting, is it's not, and they're not all the same house, right? Yeah, these are not all modern boxes. So true. There's the Parenchio Estate, which is a pedigreed. Bel Air property yep. with, uh, I think it's, what, 8, 10, 12 acres? It's, it's a huge piece of property yep. with uh, sort of a palatial mansion on the property. It was, I think, the Beverly Hillbillies estate. Exactly. That's not selling. Yep. Then you have, like, 10 or 12 acres in Beverly Park. That's not selling. You have, you know, the old Candy Spelling estate, yep. which Petra Ecclestone owns. That's not selling. You have the helicopter, Modern, and the one next door to it. Those aren't really selling. So they're all different. Some are, some are spec houses. Some came from yeah. notable people or, or they're uh, of notable design or architecture. They're in different parts of the city. So it's not due to the style. It's more due to actually... It's just that I just don't think LA is an over $100 million market yet. Yeah. You know, the most expensive house ever to sell in LA County still is, what, $110 million, that yeah, one in Malibu? Yeah. And, and, I mean, on one hand, you can probably count in the last five years all the houses that have sold for over $75 million. That's so true. Not that many. So it's going to be... I'm glad I'm not one of those developers. I'm not in that position. Because I think they're going to have to make some tough choices at yeah. some point. No, I think you're 100% right. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to you, actually, Jesse. So obviously you now are in this situation where you're doing interior design or managing and kind yeah. of overseeing interior design, landscaping, architectural design. Yeah. All of that. Is there one part of the business that actually is your favorite, would you say? That you kind of, uh, if there was, you know, okay, I could do one of four things today, do you lean towards more of one? Or is it just the creative vibe of that kind of... I think the beginning is the most fun. It's kind of like, really? it's the honeymoon. Yeah, when you first have a new client and, and there's this energy in the beginning and you're sort of, you're problem solving. You're yeah. sorting out all the pieces. That's the part I enjoy the most. Okay. You know, once you're once you've designed a house and permitted a house and you're building a house, it's fascinating. It's really fun. It's fun to be to see the progress and it's fun to see it come together. It's fun to see people get excited as you know their house goes up. It's fun to see them living there later. Um, all of it's really incredibly interesting and and rewarding yeah. and fun and it's so personal. But I don't know, the beginning is the most fun. Laying a house out, really like getting it out of people, what, what they, they really want, because they don't know what they want. Yeah. So you have this fun sort of psychological scavenger hunt with people of trying to sort of, and then you have two people, so you kind of have a really complicated fun of yeah. like Not merging. Each other, together. Yeah, so I think it's fun. It's a little bit of psychology. It's a little bit of design. Um, you know, it's watching people compromise. It's learning how to build within a budget, you know, everybody has a budget. I don't care how wealthy they are. Yeah, so I, we've never had a client ever in the history of our firm who doesn't have a budget and who doesn't get upset when the budget is broken, is broken or gets out of hand. So that's what I enjoy, you know, planning a space, planning it out, helping somebody find the property, mm -hmm. the big vision in the beginning. Cause I don't know, it's sort of like it's. Cause actually, yeah. So I think that that is fascinating because I obviously I talk a lot on our platforms to our Instagram followers, the people on the podcast about how I'm a real estate agent. So I'm kind of in the sales industry. Right. But it's more actually I do more therapy work. <laughs> and so I look at my situation I'm like, OK, 30 days, escrow, 60 days, 90 days, maybe as that's the time I'm dealing with that person. They're spending a huge amount of money. So it's a massively stressful process. Yeah, keeping them happy and under control. Them through, but yeah. your job must be that on steroids because it's not just you're dealing with someone for a month to three months yeah. and is this right, is that right, tick the boxes and get a signature. I mean, you are taking them through every single decision and then they're changing that. I mean, how do you cope with that? I, I, you enjoy it. Oh, so. it's fun. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I mean, what a cool job. I mean, there are yeah. days I get up and go, wow, do I really do this? For I get paid to do this? Still, you, know? you get that. Yeah, I mean, gosh, how fortunate am I? You know, I get to... I get to deal with just incredible people, right? And, yeah. and and it's not because they have a lot of money. It's just, you know, a lot of times you're dealing with very successful people who are really fascinating. You know, yeah. they've they've built a business or they've created something or they're 
they're they're they're the kind of people that a lot of other people would die to be in the same room with some of these clients. Oh, sure. Not because they're famous or rich, but because these are really successful, interesting people who've accomplished a lot probably yeah. in their life. And so we get to have this incredibly personal time and experience with them, which is really rare, yeah. right? You you do too. And so that's really fun. And then you get to you get to spend their money with them. I mean, yeah. you get to live vicariously through people. Oh, and, that is an element for you actually as well, isn't it? Well, Basically, for you too, I would imagine. You know, like, yeah. you know, if you had the good fortune of buying a $50 million house yourself, yeah. great. But if you don't, here, you get to get do to it with somebody around, else. Yeah, see the, the yeah. emotional response. And so, but I suppose you could actually... Do you ever have that with your own house? Is it's kind of an issue? Because I presume you're no. constantly doing to other people like, oh, we should choose this and we should choose that. Mm-mm. You've done something in your house and you see something like, oh, maybe I should have done that. Does that ever... I personally think the trick to being successful in our related businesses, yeah. when, you are, when, you're, when you're serving or working with people who have extreme wealth yeah. and a lot of options, I think the ability to not let that get inside your own psyche and start to think, Oh my gosh, I'm like I'm just like them. Yeah. I can live like this or or to be envious of that life or really wish I had that life. I just don't have that. So, I can see somebody build an amazing home or you know, do all these incredible things or buy incredible art and furniture and I find it fascinating. But I can come to my house and it doesn't bother me in the least that I can't buy a million dollar or 3 million dollar painting or it, it just it, it it doesn't interest me and this sounds so cliche but you know these people have the exact same lives that we do yeah, that anybody so. has you know their their big concern is their kids and their and their health and you know having a happy family life and you know they build this house and whether your house is 30,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet yeah. guess what you might have a leak in the roof and you got to repaint it every 10 years and you have to do so it's all the same thing. That's it's so it's true. a bigger version of the exact same thing. Somebody may have a three hundred thousand dollar house yeah. in in Nebraska. They have to do a lot of the same things to maintain their home that somebody living in a hundred million dollar house in Bel Air may have to do. So I just see the commonality of it all. I yeah. don't see, and so I see other people in our business trying to emulate or get a taste of that life and it just looks like a lot of work to me yeah, it looks no, stressful i agree um, i think and you're 100 percent right because i think a huge amount of people when they see the people that we deal with they see them on the tv or yeah. in those moments which is oh look at this person in living their lavish lifestyle yeah i think we see the person in their day-to-day routine a bit more so it becomes very normal like this is a normal human being well, they're just totally as you normal are. and exactly. they stress out just like anybody else yeah. the numbers might be different but they stress out. Oh my gosh, I thought this was going to cost X. Now it's 30% over budget. Yeah. It's just as stressful. I think there's this misconception of most people that people building expensive houses and buying expensive things, whatever it is, it's just sort of like, it's just like a lottery ticket. Like everybody's just yeah. spending money like crazy. And really some of my clients are some of the most hard ass about money and the most the most conscientious about what does that cost? Now, why does that cost yeah. so much more? Can we get a better price? Not not grinding people or, or treating them badly, but um, it's just, it's all really similar. Yeah. It, I mean, like, to me, that pings that thing, I don't know if you've heard this of Warren Buffett. Right. When he used to live with his wife before yeah. she died, um, apparently in the mornings, he would wake up, check the stock market, and yeah. depending about how he was feeling about the market that his day. McDonald's? Yes. Yeah. He would say to her, like, oh, a McMuffin or a McMuffin meal <laughs> or just like a totally. little hash brown. And so his wife would put in his cup holder in his car a dollar, a dollar twenty or Amazing. 86 cents. Totally. And you think, world's richest man for however long that he, ha- he was before now Bezos is. Yeah. That is the kind of like level that it takes to get to being the world's richest man. Totally. You can't just make the billions and billions and billions and spend half of it. Literally every single transaction in those people's lives yeah. is how do I nickel and dime and get the best deal that I possibly well, can. What's the value? What, am I getting a value for this? Yeah. Is there a diminishing return at some point? Yeah. It's funny being around all these really incredible elaborate houses and cars and all these things. All I see is the headache. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm thrilled. My clients love their homes and I, I hope we build dozens of luxury homes a year or design them rather for, for decades to come, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a wonderful business and we love it and people love their homes. 
I look at the prospect of having like someone working in your house every single day and having no privacy and having gardeners and this and that and maintaining all this. It looks exhausting to me personally. Yeah. You know, or you know, you see someone driving a, a Lamborghini or a Rolls Royce. They hit a pothole. You know. And there's a law. And they've got to <laughs> have their car flatbed towed, and it's five thousand dollars for. It's just I don't know. Yeah. It, no, it wouldn't appeal to me. So are you is that been you since you were young, or do you think that's evolved that now you're more minimal in the kind of way that you want you know less but good things in your life to, not to worry about? I think when you have a front row seat, yeah, to how people me. live, who can who can have anything they want, it's such an interesting education, and I'm sure you see the same thing. Uh, it's 100%. like it's surprising in some ways about how conscientious people are about being good stewards of their their wealth. Yeah, right. It's about how, how much people really do care and really keep an eye on their money and they really notice who's looking out for them. And trust is a big thing, yeah. right, with people of, of wealth or, or people who are successful. The biggest thing is... But yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's just maybe having seen enough of it. If I want to walk through a fancy house on any given day, I can walk through a fancy or a big house, yeah. right? And it's beautiful and it's exciting and I we love designing them, but... I can leave and go home to my 2,700 square foot house. Yeah. And, and it's funny. My partner and I sit in our house, which is 2,700 square feet, and we go, we don't even use half this. Really? I mean, it's, I mean, it's just funny. Do we funny. Need to downsize? Human That's beings amazing. don't, yeah. you know, as, as the founder of our firm always used to say, we're not in the business of need. We're in the business of want. Nobody needs oh a 50,000 square foot house. Nobody needs 90% of the things that we all have. Yeah. I mean... By the world standards, I live an incredibly good life. Oh, yeah. By Beverly Hills standards, I'm probably poor. Yeah. You know, or working class. So it's just, it's all perspective. Well, that's what's that would pinged in my head, actually, because someone said that the other day, which was, to be in the 1% of the world, do you know what your annual income needs no, to be? No. $400,000. Incredible. That puts you in the top 1%. And yeah. everyone out there, I think, who watches the, the news, and watches entertainment, all that, sure. like, well, I want to make a million a year. And I'm like, you do realize that puts you in like the zero point three percent of the entire world. Like, it's not. But we, I think because everyone now can see everyone else's lives, because we live in a social world, we live in a TV, sure. a movie. Sure. It definitely we're going through that weird transition of people are like, well, hold on, he's got that, I want that. But there was some dis- I think, statistic I don't remember. I saw it was on Instagram or I saw it in, on the New York Times or somewhere. It was the number of millionaires for 2018 yeah. increased some incredible really? percentage yeah you'll have to find that but it was an it was a it was a significant jump in awesome. the number of people whose net worth was now um over a million dollars who was con- who were considered millionaires so but yeah it's just interesting it's by la standards yeah. you know you know my partner and i both are professionals and work and we're fortunate but by la standards you know we're just sort of one of the mass here yeah. you know we're, but if we lived in i don't know rural texas yeah we'd probably be like the kings of this, you know, hundred percent. it's interesting. Yeah. So it's all, and you can easily, you can be very fortunate and successful in LA yeah. and still be oh. sort of feel like you're getting nowhere. Yeah. I mean, and I think my wife and I have that a little bit cause she starts, she started her business and she doesn't take a salary sure. from it, reinvest everything back into it. So I, I make a good salary or well, not salary, but I make good money. Sure. However, meals in LA can be oh, yeah. it, like I have friends who like come from even sometimes from New York and they're like what yeah how much is this and yeah. I'm like yeah well you can imagine if you make a good salary it gets eaten away at pretty quickly <laughs> it's not just the property prices totally. <laughs> um okay so Jesse you basically did not go straight into real estate or the real estate kind of side architecture architecture yeah. that yeah. kind of side no. I think from what I kind of read about you in a couple of articles that I saw was written Art was kind of where you started. Apparel and then art. Apparel and then art. Yeah, two two not not fun businesses. So you didn't enjoy that. I did, but you know, apparel, as you know, your wife's in the apparel business. Gosh, I mean, by the time you get, by the time you make a garment and get it out to the marketplace, yeah. you're already what four seasons behind or something crazy. Definitely. I mean, it's literally treading water, yeah. and it's just so trend driven. It just wasn't for me. It's it's talk about an unglamorous business to be in unless you're in the absolute tip top of the pyramid definitely um and then yeah i found myself in the art world for a while and um even worse right and this was in the time when like i think damien hurst was just f- doing his um first really notable 
collection and sale of it was like I think it was the animals in formaldehyde. Do you remember the that? Gold plated shark. Oh, the shark. Yeah, there was, was a shark that sold yeah. for like 110 million pounds. And then I literally was just thinking, <laughs> what the hell? I mean, like all we've just yeah. been talking about with the house and everything like that. To me, that goes to another level. But and I remember I'm thinking, just like wow, like how do you even make sense of that? I mean, I know art is completely subjective, but how, how does a rational person really do that? So yeah, and, and my love always for my entire life has always been architecture and design. And But I think that actually weirdly, and after I read those articles and the conversations we've had, I yeah. think that that gives you a massive edge on the general person Maybe. that does what you do in this city. Because yeah. I think I read something in an article that was written about you where it said, for you, the product is, it's a unique almost piece of art. Yeah. So it's actually, you're not trying to copy the one next door. You're not trying yeah. to do... You really need to like work out what that person is wanting or yeah. what that location is doing, and then, then I read about you be coming from that art side, and then yeah. my head was like, oh my god, of course. Then you're almost seeing that as like sure a unique thing because everything is in real estate. You can't have the same location, same property. It's not like a pair of shoes you can sell to ten people. You can, but. It's a totally different... But this, yeah, and yeah. But that, I think that's where I see, maybe not at the super luxury end, but there are a lot of developers who just do stuff on the west side, Yeah. and the, they just make slight adjustments to the same yeah. plan, because it's a 5,000 square foot lot, let's stick the same house on it, yeah. or let's move that slightly. And I'm just like, oh, like it just kind of hurts my soul a little bit. It's amazing, too, that people are okay with buying a house... I'll tell you a great example. There's a neighborhood here called um, Beverly Wood, and yeah. you know, and it's kind of on fire a little bit, right? And it's yeah. it's not a crazy expensive market compared to some of the ones we've been talking about. But these are what three, four, five million dollar houses. Yeah. By most standards, expensive homes. Yeah. I drove down one block. I don't know six months ago, and out of maybe fifteen houses on this block, I'd say eight were new, right? Ground up spec houses. Yeah. I, I was sitting and looking back and forth and they were exact duplicates of one another. They might no. change a light fixture. They might. And so it's fascinating to me. I mean, I think you have two choices when you're in the design world and it could be anything, architecture, fashion, jewelry, whatever yeah. it is. You can either choose to have a look that's your look that people come to you for. There are a lot of architects and designers in the city who you can walk up to their house and you know instantly who did it? this is a so-and-so, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Or, and there's nothing wrong with that. Some people like that. Some people like the prestige of people knowing this is a so-and-so house. One of the cornerstones of our company, that's not better or worse, it's just different, is we design the house that the clients want and we give them our advice and we give them our expertise. But I was always told, we want people to pull up and say, this is the client's house. This is their house. This isn't a Harrison house. It's yeah. their house, right? And so I don't think we have... A look in some markets like Atlanta, for instance, where we've we're, been there we're, for a long time, we've been there for decades, yeah. and there are some similarities of all the architecture in Atlanta. Only because people tend to be a bit Atlanta's a little bit more traditional, mm -hmm. right? Traditional homes are more common, yeah. And there are certain styles that are just really popular. So you might look at some of our Atlanta work, for instance, and you'll see some similarities, yeah. right? Okay. In a market like LA. We just have a lot more freedom because you can drive down any block in LA and you'll see, see 10 different styles of home. Definitely. So we're lucky here because 10 different clients will want 10 different things. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just different. I, I wouldn't want to be known for a look. Yeah. Um, well, because yeah, because then you were saying that and I'm, my head then goes back to London because in the Victorian era, a developer would build a street. Right. And so therefore it's a terrace sure. street. They're yeah. all attached and it's all two up, two down, same layout, same yeah. look, same everything. And for some reason, people look at that now and they're like, this is beautiful. Because you, you, it's almost the character of the street. True. But I think you're right. Like, it's almost if you drive down a street and you see one house like that and then three down on the other side, you, like, there's just not the same kind of... Wouldn't appeal me. to me, but, yeah. but never underestimate so people's fear yeah. of being different. Yeah. And so the reason developers and builders build kind of the same thing over and over again yeah, yeah. like you know we walk into these houses and anybody listening and if you google all these houses that are being built i could probably write you 10 things you're going to find in these houses big slabs of marble over yeah. the fireplace like there's just the same thing book match design book matched yeah. and the you know, linear fireplace and the wide plan card you know it's like the pivot door like they all they're all pretty much the same thing with yeah. front variations door. right yeah well, it's because they know what sells yeah. and they don't want to take a risk.
And I don't blame them. And people don't want to be risky, you know? You know, actually, which was one that I saw recently, which is just sold, which actually I was very impressed with, and I think met in the middle ground of that yeah. really well, was Bentley, Bentley Circle. Yeah, Bentley Circle, which was owned by a client of mine and, and sold it to, to the developer who did it, yeah. Stunning. That was, that, was uh, that had, that guy had guts. And that was the funny thing, because actually apparently that developer, it was his first development. Yeah. So he'd never done one before, and I literally I was chatting to the guy that did all the stone work there. Yeah. He was saying the guy redid the waterproof flashing on the roof five times. Wow. And they're doing it the fifth time, and the guys are like, "You do realize, like, we never do this more than twice. Like, there's no need to really do it more than once." And he's like, "I don't care," and and because it was almost like he's not the developer mindset of like yeah. keep it to the minimum, yeah. and there was a huge amount of like character in that house. Yeah. Where there was definitely some of those elements that were similar. It was similar. ballsy. I mean, it was, yeah. he took a point of view, he went for it. Yeah. I think in this market, what you're going to see going forward is big risk, big reward. big reward. People who spend the money on good design, people who take some chances, and people who have a really distinctive point of view. We talked about that Lenny Kravitz design. Exactly. House. Same one, yeah. Everybody laughed and snickered, and, and like, that's never going to sell, because... By West Side standards, that wasn't like the location that they all thought was. And the lot was not your. Yeah, it was. It was definitely. Yeah. It took some vision, and I have to give them credit. All the people who did that house and the agents who helped conceptualize that. Yeah. Um, it sold, and it sold for I think a record breaking number. Yeah. And somebody later asked me in real estate, I don't understand, and I said I understand. They just went for it. Yeah. They took. They they figured out who the buyer was. Yeah. Rather than trying to appeal to fifty buyers kind of lukewarm buyers, yeah. they decided to appeal to five or ten buyers who would absolutely have to have it and love it, and that's what worked. And they traded off an incredible brand, Lenny Kravitz, his name that he's built, and like is actually just a respectable, Totally unorthodox. Vibe. What yeah. other developer is going to sit around a boardroom table and say, so I have an idea. Let's build the most expensive house in this neighborhood. Yeah. Let's hire an ex-rock and roll star, or a rock and roll star, rather, yeah. to design it, and let's make it like a, a sex, drugs, and rock and roll house yeah. from the 70s or 80s. It's, on paper, yeah. doesn't sound super smart, but but I think you're going to see people with a good gut instinct in the next ten to twenty years, really start to have a point of view, yeah, and start like branding these houses and doing interesting things with them. That's the stuff I think is going to sell these generic boxes with the same old thing, yeah. and and cheesy gimmicks like the helicopter on the roof. Yeah. Not to be mean, but like yeah, no, I think you're right. When well, you it doesn't know, work and it's like just there to show and that's it. I just I can't imagine a scenario where I want to spend a hundred and seventy million dollars on a house with a helicopter that doesn't work on the roof. To me, if anything, like that kind of stuff is funny because it's sort of like I've got to remove. Hey, let's take your helicopter for a spin. Yeah, <laughs> oh no, 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 no! It's just you know I got a Ferrari in the garage with no engine, but we can go sit in it. I've got to hurry and clean this twenty four hours yeah. a day. It's dusty outside, and then yeah. I mean, yeah, I completely agree. You know what? Actually, weirdly, with the Kravitz house, I heard that the person that ended up buying it, and I could be completely wrong on this, um, didn't actually. I think they maybe saw it really briefly because they were having they had an event there. I think they arranged You're right, they did. They had a they had a like a launch party. Yeah, yeah, and then his PA apparently called him and said, Everyone at this event think it's the best house they've ever seen Amazing. and I'm obsessed with it. Amazing. And the guy bought it the next day. Amazing. That's what I heard. So I don't want to put any like pressure behind that, but I was like, when you've kind of got that, when the buy in of that level and everyone around someone of that stature is saying it's amazing. That's what they really care about. It's not actually, yeah. you know, the price. Well, I think anybody, when you're designing anything, yeah. think about the most successful people in historically in any creative industry, right? Yeah. Whether it's architecture, design, fashion, whatever it is. Yeah. The people with the really distinctive points of view who really go for it yeah. are the people that end up really enduring. Yeah. And those are the people who are the most sought after. So true. And the people that do not listen to everyone else around them's yeah. opinion. And they're not they derivative. vision. Yeah. yeah. And so I think, I think, I think what you're going to see is as this huge glut of inventory of these mega homes that developers have built, kind of pandering to the masses, yeah. the wealthy masses, right down the middle with these sort of architecturally confused, not particularly um, well thought out houses yeah. that just sort of tick off this generic checklist of, of amenities. Yeah. I, I, once that sort of once that's worked itself out, which I think is going to be a painful process for a lot of people, I think people are going to step back and go, "Wait a minute, what did we do wrong here?" And the people who've been successful, who have built these really striking houses with significant of points of view that are real pieces of art and spent the money on designing them, 
and really brought in the experts to do it, I think you're going to see a complete change yeah. in the landscape of how these houses are built. In my head, I always compare it with the like ice cream. It's like everyone kind of likes vanilla. Yeah. So those guys are just building a ton of vanilla, very expensive houses, which yeah. a lot of people like, but they're not falling in love with. If they built the pistachio or whatever it was, yeah, the most lilac, people hate CBD, it. burnt cherry bourbon. Exactly. That's yeah. what's going to sell, right? Because yeah. then the people that love that, they're totally. not going to be able to turn it down. Whereas yeah. you're kind of not just playing to the mass market, you're finding your niche of the yeah. person that's really going to love it, and you're going after that full force. That's what I, I, I agree. Okay. You know, all yeah. the people at the top of our business yeah. have a point of view, I think. Um, and if they don't, I think it's going to be harder and harder for them. Because, you know, as people, now that this is becoming a global city, yeah. and you have, I mean, I'm sure you see it. I mean, we have clients from all over the world, Definitely. from every continent, and people of every background in terms of what they do and where they're from and what their experiences are and how they attain their wealth, everybody's going to have higher standards now. People are going to expect more. And I just, when I talk to the people at the top of our business and they walk through some of these houses, they're just not impressed. It's they're big and they're, they're, I guess, fancy and they have a lot of stuff, but they're just not, they're not memorable. Yeah. Uh, and they're literally like because I do LA mansion tours yeah. it is amazing now two and a half years after I started before I'd walk into every house I'm like this view is so different whatever now I'm like <laughs> yep seen mm, it seen it yeah done. It's, kind of, it's like that one but not quite as nice <laughs> kind of thing that is literally yeah. like what comes out of my mouth which is kind of crazy and I maybe need to just take a little bit of a chill pill and think how lucky are you to be walking into this incredible house nah just there. keep like, bagging yeah. on them it's alright it'll serve you well okay Jesse I think we need to round this up because okay. literally I think it's been kind of a crazy situation where I think we've only scratched the surface and we could probably sit here for another 10 hours and talk through a sure whole load would of other people would love topics. to hear that right exactly yeah well actually my editor would probably hate me because he'd be like 10 hours of stuff to go through and do. but I think I'd love to have you back on the thing yeah, I'd sure. like to actually just finish up with a question yeah. Um, and actually we'll give your information and stuff because if anyone out there is sure. wanting to kind of ask you some questions or anything, sure. is that something you'd be open to doing? Yeah, is kind of, of course. Perfect. Um, is there in your head a favorite project that you've ever worked on? Hmm. Um, I probably should have given some more like headwind to that because there's some, I know that there's some incredible clients you've got and some incredible projects. So, you know, my favorite projects, uh, there's not really one specifically, okay. but uh, one or two. It's not really the project itself. My favorite projects are when people, when the clients really want to do it the right way. Meaning I have a client right now, it's a new project and, and, and an ongoing project with another client. And these are clients who absolutely love building houses. So it's so much more fun to do a project with somebody who loves it as much as you do and who are willing to spend the time and money to do it the right way. Yeah. They don't want to find something and knock it off. They want the real thing. And it's not just about spending money. It's just doing it the right way. They want to hire craftsmen and they want to hire, they want to buy the materials that are the, the real McCoy. And Do you never hate it when they pull down the marble three times because it doesn't look quite right? Uh, or do you like that? It can be frustrating. Like, yeah, yeah okay. I mean, I don't want, I, I hate seeing people waste money yeah. and I hate seeing people um, have a frustrating experience and that happens a lot because it's just building as difficult and messy and and it's it's lengthy but seeing somebody who really 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 enjoys the process as much as i do and we do and all the people that i work with it can be exhausting sometimes because what should be a 10 minute conversation is like an hour and a half conversation but to me that's the most fun because when you have a client who's sort of indifferent and they're not really into it it's fun but it's just not as exciting right you still build a good product but when you have the clients who are really into it um And I can think of a couple of clients that we've had that are just, they absolutely just, they can't wait. They can't wait from Friday to Monday to talk about it some more. And they can't wait to, to be on site and they find the construction just incredible and magical. And, and so it's, that's kind of my favorite because it's rare. You don't, you don't get that very often. You don't get people who really want to do it the right way. So it's actually the process and the journey of creating it that you love the most, not the finished product kind of thing. It's both. both. It, it, and in the end, that product ends up being like a jewel box, you know? I mean, and you walk through that house and you think it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And most people may not notice, but you'll notice things and you'll know, wow, like this client really understood the difference between A and B. Yeah. And they invested the money in doing it the proper way. Right way. Or like really having it done well, like real stone and real... Um, you know, all the the real 
materials mm-hmm. that make the difference between a really good house and like an exceptional house. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's my favorite. It's I just fun. That. Yeah. It's kind of geeky. And actually, out. I think like you look at that being your career, and you're like, if you love that, totally, that's kind of awesome because every day you're happy when you're actually yeah. loving what you're doing. Yeah. Which is incredible. Cool. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Jesse, for coming. Yeah, my on. pleasure. Yeah, and it's actually been a real pleasure to have you here and to kind of get your insight on that kind of luxury high end part of the market sure. and what you do. Sure. Um, if any of you guys out there have any questions, definitely put them in the comments section below or just send me a DM or a message on our Instagram, Hutch Johnson or Housesgram. And uh, if they're good questions, I'll get them over to Jesse. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to like flood everyone because I know that your schedule is pretty crazy. That's uh, all right. And yeah. so I don't want everyone... If, if people out there are wanting to kind of follow you, and I think you've got an Instagram account that's private. Uh, Does... Yeah, we, we have... A, our firm has an Harrison. Instagram. It's just Harrison Design. They okay. can uh, search that on Instagram. And Perfect. then our website's just harrisondesign.com. Harrisondesign.com. So yeah. yeah, if you guys have any questions or you'd like to kind of look in a bit more depth about what Jesse does, what his company does... Um, definitely go and find them there sure. and uh, I'm just really excited and actually I'm hoping Jesse that we can maybe tour one of your projects at some stage yeah, so I don't want to put you on record or like anything like that but if there is anything got a couple thinking, in mind for you yeah, yeah. If there's anything where you guys are like we need to see that let us know and we'll try and get it done but obviously it can be very difficult dealing with the yeah, privacy just... and yeah everything there's always there. a way yeah, yeah. awesome yeah. Well, thank you so much again, Jesse. Yeah, uh, th- thank you, everyone out there, for listening. Uh, as always, we want your feedback, so let us know what you liked, what you heard, what you didn't. Uh, we've got actually two more podcasts we're recording uh, next week, and I'm really, really sorry that actually we've had a three-week hiatus on the podcast because of my leg. And actually, I was thinking this morning, Jesse, I was thinking, why has that been a hiatus? It's almost the thing I should have been doing more than anything else because a podcast doesn't require me really to use this, whereas going and doing LA Mansion tours does. No, I thought, isn't that a known thing that when you injure your leg, it's hard to talk? Oh, no. (laughs) Let's put it out there, guys. Makes perfect sense, yeah. yeah. But anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll be back with another episode next week. And uh, as always, let us know what you liked and let us know what you hated. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. (laughs) 